Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Chapter 8, Social Ecologist The oil crisis had one positive effect, it raised popular awareness of renewable energy. Suddenly solar panels and wind turbines were hot news, and do-it-yourself manuals flew off bookstore shelves. In 1973 E. F. Schumacher published Small is Beautiful, which argued that giant cities have undergone pathological growth and have led to unprecedented anonymity, isolation, social atomization. What was needed was an appropriate technology that was small in scale and compatible with the laws of ecology. Such technology he said, would be conducive to decentralization. If it sounds like Bookchin's ideas in our synthetic environment, that's because they were, and Schumacher gave him credit. I agree with Mr. Bookchin's assertion, he wrote, that reconciliation of man with the natural world is no longer merely desirable it has become a necessity. Not that he shared Bookchin's radical social agenda, Schumacher wanted a middle way between socialism and capitalism, something he vaguely called Buddhist economics. Small is Beautiful became an international bestseller, quoted by everyone from Prince Charles to California Governor Jerry Brown. The world was ready to hear these ideas, a year after Schumacher's book appeared, Harper published a new edition of Our Synthetic Environment, which got far more attention now than it had the first time around. Buchan's influence was felt elsewhere in the culture as well. In 1974 the science fiction author Ursula K. L. Egan published The Dispossessed, a utopian novel about anarchism and revolution, capitalism, and collectivism. Buchan's pre-1980 writings, L. Egan told me, were one of the major sources for the thinking that went into my anarchist utopia The Dispossessed. In 1975 Ernst Kallenbach used Buchan's word Ecotopia as the title for another popular novel. Even Herbert Marcuse finally acknowledged the importance of the ecology issue, in his 1972 book, Counter-Revolution and Revolt. The discovery of the liberating forces of nature, Marcuse wrote, seeming to echo Book Chin, and their vital role in the construction of a free society becomes a new force in social change. Moreover, social and ecological change should go hand in hand, he said since the liberation of man to his own human faculties is linked to the liberation of nature. Buchan's efforts to interest Marcuse in ecology had finally borne fruit. In Burlington, some of the members of the Fresh Ground Collective wanted to turn the coffee house into a conventional business. Others objected, but the first group prevailed, and the collective structure was discarded. The normalized coffee house would serve coffee, soup, and bread throughout the 1970s. Around this time, in the autumn of 1972, a graduate student from Goddard College approached Bookchin with a proposal to become a regular lecturer there. Dan Choderkoff explained that a philosophy teacher had initiated a lecture series called Technology and Society then abruptly departed the college in mid-semester. A replacement was needed to coordinate the series. Goddard College is located about 50 miles from Burlington, in the mountains of central Vermont, on a former dairy farm. Choderkoff, a one-time new leftist, had attended as an undergraduate and read Buchan's work, he planned to write his master's thesis about anarchism. When he learned that Bookchin was living in nearby Burlington, he wanted him for his advisor. He had lobbied Goddard to let him offer Bookchin the teaching post. With his low-key but determined manner, Choderkoff set out to persuade Bookchin to accept. The college, he surely explained, had an international reputation as a progressive school, innovating in independent study and off-campus learning. It used evaluations instead of grades to assess students' work. Its approach to education was based on principles of John Dewey, students decided what they wanted to study, devised their own curriculum, then drew conclusions from their experience. In early 1970s the school, with its alternative ambience, was attracting hundreds of students from the counterculture, open-minded, eager to initiate and manage their own studies. Bookchin hesitated as he listened to Chodorkov's offer, since he had a heavy lecture schedule and two books to write. But Goddard was appealing, 
it reminded him of the non-hierarchical, experimental modern schools, founded by a Catalonian anarchist in the 1910s. So he accepted. Arriving at Goddard in February 1973, he glimpsed for the first time the brown shingled farm buildings nestled among landscaped gardens, against the stunning backdrop of the Green Mountains. As Chodorkov told me, Murray didn't want to coordinate the lecture series. He wanted to be the lecture series. Those first lectures were a revelation, he recalled, some of the best I ever heard him give. The students gave Murray excellent evaluations, and Goddard invited him to teach a course the next semester. When Book Chin lectured at colleges and universities, students would come up to him afterward and ask where they could study the kinds of creative, visionary, and imaginative approaches to ecology that he had talked about. But he was perpetually stumped, he knew of no program to recommend. At the same time, as he traveled the lecture circuit, he had met quite a few cutting-edge thinkers in the ecotechnics, organic farming, and neighborhood movements. In November 1973 he and Chodorkov decided to bring these innovative thinkers together with idea-hungry ecology-minded students for a three-day conference at Goddard. Among them were Wilson Clark, a designer of solar and wind power systems, De Sharaudi, a pioneer in solar architecture from MIT, Eugene Eckley, an alternative energy expert, and Sam Love, editor of Environmental Action magazine. Also present at that first conference was John Todd, an oceanographer and aquatic biologist. In 1972, partly inspired by a close reading of Buchin's Towards a Liberatory Technology, Todd had begun applying his scientific training to the task of averting ecological disaster. He and several others had founded New Alchemy Institute on a farm in Falmouth, Massachusetts.13 There they pioneered growing fruit and vegetables in greenhouses heated by the sun, a 1,700-gallon water-filled cylinder absorbed and stored solar heat throughout the day, then radiated it back to the building during the night. Todd and his associates stocked such cylinders with tilapia, a herbivorous, freshwater fish that thrives on algae and insect larvae, they had come across it in East Africa. Experimentation showed that they could grow edible tilapia in 10 weeks. The cylinder's water, complete with fish wastes, was then used to irrigate the fruit and vegetable gardens. This closed-loop system, which they called a bio-shelter, could produce fish, fruit, and vegetables year-round, regardless of season, through even the bitterest New England winters, with occasional backup from a wood-burning stove. And the exchange of nutrients between plants and animals meant that little, if any, petroleum-based fertilizer was needed. Todd doubtless told the Goddard Conference about this integration of solar energy aquaculture, and organic gardening. Also present was a colorful, outspoken neighborhood organizer from Washington, D.C. Book Chin had met Carl Hess late in 1968, at a supper hosted by the anarcho-capitalist Murray Rothbard. Hess had been a speechwriter for Barry Goldwater and in 1964 had penned his speech with the notorious line, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. Subsequently Hess had become a new leftist, associated with SDS and the Black Panthers, then identified himself as a left libertarian, an anarchist. He refused to pay federal income tax, as an act of political resistance, whereupon the IRS put a 100% lien on his future earnings. So Hess learned to weld and eked out a livelihood by bartering welding work for food and other goods, outside the money economy. At Rothbard's dinner, Hess and Book Chin had recognized each other as kindred libertarian spirits, talented autodidacts, they both opposed big business as well as big government. In 1970 Hess was living in Adams Morgan, an ethnically and economically mixed neighborhood in his native Washington, D.C. Young counterculturists were moving in, opening food co-ops and communes of all sorts. Hess set up a shop in an old warehouse and taught neighborhood residents how to use saws and drills. As they achieved mastery, he found, they gained confidence, they began talking about what we did and what we can do. Experimentation became a community pastime in Adams Morgan. A science teacher built a solar collector out of cat food cans, capable of heating household air to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. 
a marine engineer set up an outside mirror to collect energy from the sun, then devised an indoor cooker to put that energy to use. Hess and his friends Gilfriend and David Morris experimented with ways to grow food in cities, in self-sustaining and permanent loops which we can directly control on a neighborhood level. They transformed vacant lots into community gardens. They experimented with French intensive gardening, a method particularly fitting for urban farming because it brings two to eight times the yield of traditional gardens with half the water consumption. They collected vegetable wastes from local food co-ops, composted it in pits dug in abandoned driveways, and they used horse manure from a park police stable as fertilizer. They constructed hydroponic gardens. On the flat roofs of the neighborhood's three-story row houses, they set up boxes with organic soil, where they grew vegetables. Basements turned out to be the ideal place to grow sprouts. Perhaps it was at the 1973 Goddard Conference that Hess found out about New Alchemy's closed-loop bio-shelters whenever it was, he went to work building large fish tanks for Adams Morgan basements. He would salvage discarded washing machines, remove the motors, and connect them with power pumps to create a current against which the fish could swim. They flourished, an urban basement, he found, could produce fish at a cost of less than a dollar per pound. These projects proved, said Hess, that an urban neighborhood could be self-sufficient in the production of its food and wealth. Their work showed Bookchin that ecotechnics could contribute not only the technological infrastructure but the economic base for urban decentralism. At the 1973 Goddard Conference, about 50 people exchanged ideas about fish farming and solar power and organic agriculture, about eco-decentralism and utopia. The give and take was lively and the event was such a smashing success that afterward Murray and Dan decided to launch a regular summer program, taught by Goddard faculty, supplemented by these same guest lecturers. They called it the Social Ecology Studies Program, using the name coined two decades earlier by E.A. Gutkind, to reflect the indissoluble connection between social problems and ecological problems. The program, Book Chin wrote in the proposal, would integrate the practical with the intellectual. The hands-on curriculum would instruct students in organic gardening, solar panel and windmill construction, aquaculture, and community organizing. The intellectual curriculum would cover the politics of ecology decentralism, and community, urban history, radical history, social theory, psychology, and much more. Nothing like it existed in the United States. Choderkoff, savvy about bureaucracies, shepherded the proposal through the Goddard administration, which accepted it and hired him to coordinate it. The first session was scheduled to run for three months in the summer of 1974, long enough that students could immerse themselves. The program had no advertising budget, but John Shuttleworth of Mother Earth News came to the rescue, donating a full-page advertisement in his magazine. Thanks to that ad, the session attracted a hundred students. Book Chin inspired them by talking about historical movements for freedom. Choderkoff taught them about utopias. Aquaculture, Bill McClarney told his class by that name, can help us achieve stable integrated, efficient food production systems and even regional or local economic self-sufficiency. Eugene Eckley told his solar class, solar energy is a capturing mechanism to spread out over a time period the availability of the sun. The program was underway. In 1970 the state of New Jersey had created Ramapo College, a four-year liberal arts school, on a former cattle farm in Bergen County. Too many of New Jersey's young people in those days, were leaving the state for college elsewhere, to appeal to them, the school would be open to experimentation, its structure interdisciplinary, its faculty unconventional. Among the first faculty members was Wayne Hayes, a one-time community organizer who had helped defeat the notorious Lower Manhattan Expressway, which had been proposed to run through Greenwich Village. Tall and feisty and as blunt spoken as Book Chin, Hayes held degrees in economics and city planning. Another faculty member was Trent Troyer, who taught critical theory and was writing a book on the Frankfurt School. In 1974 Hayes and Troyer created Ramapo School of Metropolitan Studies as a free academic space. 
Hearing that Murray Bookchin might be available they both wanted to hire him, but they had no tenure-track position to offer him. Hayes pieced together some courses and offered him a job anyway. Murray was interested. Hayes told him he needed to provide his resume. Murray sat down at his typewriter, inserted a brown paper bag, and typed out his life experience. When he finished, he handed it to Hayes, who noticed a glaring absence. Where was the BA? Where, for that matter, was the high school graduation? Book Chin had only a high school equivalency degree from the RCA Institute. Even if Buchin's academic credentials had been in order, persuading Ramapo to hire him was going to be a problem, Hayes realized. The founding administrators were open to things contemporary he told me, but not necessarily radical. Furthermore, when the college's vice president, Robert Cassidy found out that Hayes had offered Book Chin a job, he was furious. How could you represent that we had a job when we didn't? Cassidy shouted at him. It was basic fraud, Hayes told me. I was in big trouble. What to do? Hayes invited Book Chin, basically, to audition. For the mice and scene, he chose a large wood paneled classroom, he brought in several classes worth of students and made sure Cassidy was present as well. Hayes introduced Book Chin, who proceeded to discourse for several hours, with no index cards or notes about the medieval city and Stott looked mocked free, and the origins of capitalism. It was a spellbinder, a fantastic talk, Hayes recalled. Afterward everyone said wow, and Cassidy was blown away. But Buchan's lack of academic credentials still bothered Cassidy. So Hayes asked Murray to bring all his published writings out to the college. Buchan showed up with a box of the just-published limits of the city. Hayes brought it into Cassidy's office, turned it over, and emptied the contents onto the desk. Take a look at this stuff and tell me we don't want this guy he told Cassidy with or without the degree. Later that day Cassidy called Hayes, let's hire him. He offered him an assistant professorship at a good salary. Book Chin started teaching at Ramapo in the fall of 1974. For the rest of the 1970s, he would teach urban studies and environmental studies at Ramapo during the regular school year, then to camp to Vermont for the summer social ecology program. Ramapo's environmental studies major soon attracted hundreds of students. And all the while Book Chin continued to barnstorm the alternative scene, lecturing indefatigably on hierarchy and domination, on decentralization and technology, and on urban gardening with solar collectors and aquaculture. He was riding the historical moment. In 1962 Book Chin had been certain that American cities had reached their limits, megalopolitan life is breaking down, psychologically, economically and biologically, he had written in our synthetic environment. A decade later the urban crisis had only intensified, due to ever greater pollution, racial strife, unresponsive city halls, police brutality, dismal housing, crumbling schools, crime, and poor social services. White middle-class families, and the business enterprises for which they worked, fled to the suburbs or to the Sun Belt. Those who remained, the less affluent, often people of color, were left to fend for themselves. Local banks would not give them loans. City governments reduced or cut off essential services to minority-dominated neighborhoods, like police patrols, garbage removal, and firefighting. Urban elites, following a policy called planned shrinkage, were actively trying to make poor neighborhoods unlivable, to drive the impoverished residents away so that developers could come in and the middle class would return. On the Lower East Side, some of those urban residents whom society had abandoned took matters into their own hands. A rough Puerto Rican street gang decided to go straight. Somehow the engineer futurist Buckminster Fuller taught them how to build geodesic domes. The domes were sturdy yet cost little to build and were easy to transport, and they had many possible applications in poor communities, as shelter, as greenhouses for urban gardens, as meeting places, and as playground structures. The gang, led by Chino Garcia, named itself Charas, after the six members' initials, 
and began building geodesic domes, east of Tompkins Square Park, in the area they took to calling Lois Aida. They recruited street kids to help and within a few years had two dozen volunteers. Dan Choderkoff, who was studying Charis for his PhD in anthropology, said that creating the domes gave the members a means of empowerment. Meanwhile, in other cities, young radicals were moving into low-income neighborhoods, where, as in Adams Morgan, they organized communes and cooperatives. When banks wouldn't lend them money for their food co-ops or community health clinics, they formed community-based credit unions. And implementing the new techniques of community organizing developed by Saul Alinsky, they mobilized residents to resist police brutality and to challenge oppressive zoning policies and urban renewal projects. Community activists began to think further, too, in terms of empowering neighborhoods, devolving political power from unresponsive city governments to popular neighborhood councils. As they escalated their pressure, city governments agreed to establish community boards, mainly to handle citizens' complaints but sometimes to allow them to participate in planning and zoning. Between 1970 and 1974, New York, Boston, Seattle Atlanta, St. Paul, Pittsburgh, and other cities created these little city halls or changed their charters to create neighborhood councils. Sociologists called it the community revolution. Observed the democratic theorist Benjamin Barber, the experiment evolved into substantial decentralization. Decentralization, once again a proposal of Buchan seemed prescient. But he and other proponents of neighborhood radicalism whom he befriended around this time thought little city halls didn't go far enough, they were just vehicles for municipal governments to pretend to seek citizens' views while continuing to accommodate moneyed interests. Milton Kotler, for one, called for effecting a wholesale political transfer from existing units of government to neighborhood assemblies. And David Morris and Carl Hess wanted neighborhoods to secede from cities altogether and devolve power to an assembly of citizens within the community who directly participate in decisions. In their 1975 handbook, Neighborhood Power, Morris and Hess showed step by step how it could be done. A crucial concept was that neighborhood activists would have to gain power in order to decentralize power, that is, they would have to participate in municipal elections, gain elective local office, and then use their power to devolve municipal power to the neighborhoods, as Book Chin had been advocating. Hess and Morris and their friends in Washington showed the way by creating a practical example. When the city stopped collecting trash in Adams Morgan and garbage piled up in the streets, a neighborhood committee organized a volunteer cleanup. Other committees sprang into being to address problems of affordable housing, pest control, and recreation. To tie themselves to the community these committees created a community government, a neighborhood assembly based on the town meeting model, as Hess wrote. Here people in the neighborhood could get together, discuss their problems, discuss solutions, and then actually decide what they themselves could do. At its peak, participation in the assembly reached 3,000. In addition to constructing political self-government, Adams Morgan residents built economic self-sufficiency as well. They farmed trout in their basements and reduced their energy bills by using solar and wind power. The stereotype, as Choderkoff observed, was that poor people were too concerned with survival to be interested in the environment. But concern with survival had the opposite effect, it was what led many of the groups to begin working on alternative technology. Renewable energy urban gardening, and aquaculture could potentially provide the basis for a self-reliant, cooperatively owned and managed neighborhood economy. In Anacostia, another Washington, D.C., neighborhood, residents also instituted a town meeting of the entire neighborhood, and when it got too big, covering too large an area, they sensibly divided into six parts and instituted six separate town meetings that met monthly and one federated meeting that met twice a year to discuss problems relative to all the neighborhoods. Anacostia residents built a bicycle factory, in an abandoned garage, and a cooperative furniture factory. Solar collectors supplied enough energy to meet half the neighborhood's heating requirements during winters as well as for cooling during summers. Enough trout and tilapia were cooperatively farmed in geodesic domes and basements to supply the neighborhood's needs for protein. 
Residents grew tomatoes hydroponically on rooftops, harvesting several tons from the roof of the Roosevelt Hotel alone. These Washington neighborhoods became relatively self-reliant with vibrant local economies, while their town meetings, observed Hess, were forms of direct participation unequaled in any city. Bookchin praised the Washington efforts for achieving urban community based on popular control of urban resources and institutions through the use of these eco-technologies. In the spring of 1974, citizens of Montreal, still chafing under the oligarchical rule of Mayor Jean Drapeau, yearned to participate in city government, to bring reality to the slogan power to the people. Community and labor organizers, peace activists, and feminists, independent radicals and socialists and environmentalists, immigrants, and homeless advocates came together to mobilize the city to finally unseat the mayor in the coming November election. In May they elected delegates to an assembly that founded the Montreal Citizens Movement, or MCM. Its program, Unville Pour News, proposed that every two years, in each neighborhood of Montreal, a citizen assembly should elect delegates to a neighborhood council. The delegates would be mandated and recallable, to ensure their accountability to the assemblies. Buchan's writings, published in Our Generation, influenced this proposal, as one historian observed, much of the political current that fueled the MCM was partially rooted in anarchism, in social ecology and in forms of libertarianism. Black Rose Books publisher Dmitry Rousseau-Polos, working with Hess, Morris, and Kodler, as well as Book Chin, formulated a call for neighborhood power that was widely read. Six months after the MCM's founding, on November 10, Montrealers handed the MCM over 40% of the vote and an astonishing 18 out of 55 city council seats. The citizen groups were jubilant. Drapo's stranglehold on City Hall was not entirely broken, but it was significantly loosened. Thereafter, said Rousseau-Polos, the movement of urban insurgency was like a dammed-up force and could not be held back. The MCM, both Bookchin and Rousseau-Polos acknowledged, was not the perfect embodiment of assembly democracy. Its general assemblies met only once a year, which was not frequent enough, Bookchin thought, and the two-year span between municipal elections was too long. Its program, although radical, was far from revolutionary. Rousseau-Polos, for his part, worried about the fact that among the MCM's founders were some pragmatically oriented politicians who were less interested in devolving municipal power or fighting capitalism than in creating a conventional, albeit municipally based, political party. Sooner or later more opportunists and careerists might descend on the MCM. Nonetheless, Bookchin found the MCM overall to be an impressive achievement. It had a robust internal democracy and a libertarian ambience. It defined itself programmatically as consciously committed to a decentralized political structure for the city. And it had good prospects, as good as one could hope for in 1974, for replacing the municipal government with a network of popular assemblies. Bookchin made frequent trips to Montreal, to inspire the citizenry with ideas of where things can go from there, as Rousseau-Polos recalled. In 1975 a half-dozen anarchist affinity groups joined the MCM, which could only strengthen its libertarian ambience. Social ecologists and anarchists were far more numerous and influential in Montreal than in any other Canadian city observes historian Timothy Lloyd Thomas. They even toyed with the idea of freeing Montreal from the constraining jurisdictional control of both the federal and provincial governments. In November 1975 an MCM party congress elected a new executive committee. Six of its eight members were libertarian socialists, committed to establishing effective neighborhood councils. One member, Stephen Schechter, was an associate of Rousseau-Polos and advocate of a revolutionary strategy. His election, said Rousseau-Polos, was a symbolic victory of the MCM's radical libertarian element. With its decentralist program, its bottom-up structure, and its libertarian executive, the MCM was turning Montreal into a laboratory for radical municipal politics. In Vermont, the social ecology studies program needed land in order to experiment with alternative technology and organic farming. 
fortuitously in 1975 a 40-acre parcel owned by Goddard became available. Kate Farm, located in a bend of the Winooski River, adjacent to the main campus, had a nine-room brick farmhouse a big uninsulated barn, several outbuildings, and glorious open fields. Chodorkov's negotiating skills did the trick, Goddard agreed to let social ecology use it. The Kate Farm grounds needed a lot of work, but the hundred-plus students who arrived for the 1975 summer session were more than eager to pitch in. They'd listen to Bookchin discourse on hierarchy and radical social theory, then go outside and do construction work. Their first task was to retrofit the farmhouse and heat its interior air, to create a year-round office for the program. When innovators in the alternative energy field arrived to lecture, they shared their expertise on how to combine solar arrays with traditional building materials. Author Wilson Clark contributed his encyclopedic knowledge of solar technology. New Mexico inventor Steve Baer explained his solar-heated drum wall houses. Desharaudi detailed how a greenhouse could harness solar radiation and store it as heat in the dirt below. For the Kate farmhouse the students and faculty finally decided to install a four-foot solar panel in its south-facing wall. But would the interior air stay warm enough during the long, overcast New England winters? To find out, they would measure the indoor temperatures that winter. Meanwhile, students and faculty built an earthen shelter into a hillside, to see if a house could be warmed solely by the sun and insulated naturally. It was the first solar building in Vermont. They went on to design and build a greenhouse a variation on the new Alchemy Bio Shelter, to house year-round closed-loop fish farming. A flat-plate solar collector installed atop this so-called sunhouse warmed the interior and the thousand-gallon fish tank inside, stocked with tilapia, catfish, clams, and more. Students fed the fish alfalfa from the garden, as well as larvae and worms, while the fish waste, rather than chemicals, was used to fertilize vegetables. Another faculty student collaboration was a horizontal axis Jacobs wind machine. Mounted atop a 60 foot steel tower, it could capture wind blowing from any direction. The energy was used to pump the sunhouse's tank water through a biological filtration unit, which aerated it and also filtered the fish wastes. A brigade from Charis came up from Lois Aida and constructed a geodesic dome to function as another greenhouse with an aquaculture tank inside. The students built an open-sided shed, for compost. There they layered hay, kitchen wastes, dirt, and animal manure in four-foot piles, which they let stand. When the compost was ready, they applied it to the soil in the open fields, to enrich it without the use of chemical fertilizers. In the farmhouse basement, they constructed a composting toilet, to recycle human wastes. These small-scale ecotechnics projects, using minimal resources, were simple enough that students with little technical training could build and manage them. In an urban context, similar ecotechnics could allow neighborhood residents, even as amateurs, to exercise control over the energy that powered their communities. Ecotechnics at the human scale could thereby transform, in a riff on Marxian terminology, technology from instruments of domination and social antagonism into instruments of liberation and social harmonization. While its sister projects, New Alchemy in Massachusetts and Farallones in California, emphasized research, the Social Ecology Studies program offered three months of total immersion for beginners in these hands-on techniques. In addition, it gave them a grounding in social theory. That first session, Dan Chodorkov taught a class on utopia, those images of the good life which have shimmered on the horizon throughout the whole of history. The feminist activist Inistra King taught a class called Women and Ecology which discussed the domination of women in relation to the domination of nature. King hoped to develop a feminist ecology movement that would solve the ecological crisis by generating truly human relationships, as opposed to relations of domination. Guest speakers included the feminist anthropologist Raina Rapp, the author and poet Grace Paley, the anti-nuclear activist Anna Gurji, and others. A women's coffee house was held on Sunday nights. Carl Hess, in his classes, described the Adams Morgan project to the students. At the town meetings, he said, 
people's personalities changed, people who had been shy spoke out. People who had seemed without hope sparked to new life. Long-time cynics and naysayers aired their gripes, but when they saw others take up their ideas and turn them into actions, their lives gained new meaning, new excitement, and a new sense of dignified purpose. The Adams Morgan assemblies were the most exciting political experiences I have ever had, Hess said. After tasting a participatory democracy I would never want to trade it for a merely representative one. And Book Chin, of course taught social ecology which by now straddled history, philosophy anthropology, and sociology, as well as social theory and politics. The students revered him for his moral imagination, his ebullience, and his generous open-heartedness. He was irrepressible as he lectured, pacing before them and gesticulating, insisting on the urgent need for a large-scale social and ecological transformation, reiterating that all the organic farming and eco-technics they were doing could not be separated from a liberated social context. Afterward, he shared his words and his time unstintingly spending hours talking to students informally and frankly. Sharing ideas did not deplete him, on the contrary it energized him. As a venue for lively political discussion in a natural setting, the social ecology program recapitulated aspects of his childhood utopia, Crotona Park. Visiting lecturers would arrive and stay for a week at a time, living among the students, advising them on their experiments, letting them pick their brains. Recalled Richard Merrill, John Todd, and I, and Murray Bookchin would stay up for hours just talking. Bookchin pushed all of us to develop a more radical critique of the culture, Sam Love told me. How he could keep it up all those years amazed me. But no matter how much everyone respected him and were inspired by him, one thing remained baffling. Even as he extolled organic farming, he was unabashedly fond of junk food. And even as he championed solar and wind energy he drove around the Goddard campus in his car, even for short distances. Everybody saw it, and everybody commented on it, former student Barry Costa Pierce recalled. The students even formed a Walk the Talk working group, so they could call each other's shots on personal behavior. Much the same thing had bothered Joyce Gardner back in 1964-65, and it bothered the Ramapo students. The thing that got people was the Twinkies, Wayne Hayes told me. He ate a lot of them. Book Chin sometimes got defensive about it, in 1978 he exclaimed to an interviewer, always the judgments what are you eating there? Such intolerance had broken up many a commune, he pointed out, pleading for forbearance. In my view, his unusual food choices were a way of asserting his proletarian background, even amid organic-minded hippies, he remained culturally working class and proudly so. His personal choices in general were also a way of pointing out that the ecological crisis was not caused by individual lifestyles, rather, its causes were systemic, and so its solutions must be collective, not individual. In any case said Costa Pierce, Nobody ever held it against him, because he gave so much. It made whatever he needed to do as a person secondary. Despite his eccentricities, agreed Richard Merrill, for those of us who saw into his heart, he was a revelation, a loyal friend, a mentor. In their downtime the social ecology students did their fair share of partying in the green mountains, swimming in the streams and pools and camping in the lush forests conscious that the 14-month program was a rare experience, one to be savored, they bonded as a community. When it ended on August 22nd, the leave-takings were often dramatic. So successful was the 1975 session that Murray and Dan proposed to turn the program into a year-round institute for social ecology, ISE. It would offer an undergraduate program for Goddard students and a summer session for anyone interested. Goddard approved the proposal, and Book Chin became the ISC's first director. As for Ramapo College, it too turned out to be a good match for Book Chin, it was an extremely left-wing place, where Marxists and anarchists squabbled, but at least they took ideas seriously, former student Jim Morley recalled. It was a very idealistic time. Book Chin found the students in New Jersey especially congenial because of their working class backgrounds, 
many of their parents worked at the huge Ford assembly plant in Magua. Yet when it came to ecotechnics, Ramapo students and faculty alike felt they were blazing new trails away from an oil-based overconsuming. The college, said Mike Edelstein, probably offered more innovative courses on renewable energy social ecology and the like than any other undergraduate institution of the area. Bookchin taught social ecology as well as the history of social thought. In classrooms whose windows looked out onto the Ramapo Mountains, he traced the ebb and flow of utopian ideas from Plato to Rousseau to Marx and the socialists, situating them all in the Western intellectual tradition. What Murray could do with that, marveled Wayne Hayes. Self-conscious about his lack of formal education, he immersed himself in urban history, to understand the rise decline, and limits of the city. Historically he observed, the city was the place where people born in a village society could migrate in order to escape the oppressions of the blood tie, of tribe and ethnicity. Village society tended to be organized according to clan, where one's status was a matter of birth. Some were privileged over others. But those who held low status in a clan-based village and chafed at it might leave those local inequities behind by departing for a city where they could join other former provincials and gain a new status, equal with others. In small cities and urban neighborhoods, in the public arena, the stranger becomes transformed into the citizen. In the cosmopolitan city the blood tie, not only ethnicity but potentially also gender and sexual identity, can give way to a concept of universal humanity. For Bookchin, this stranger welcoming and integrating, citizenship bestowing city represented the triumph of society over biology, of reason over impulse humanity over folkdom. He left his students, many of whom were children of immigrants like himself, hungering for more, Morley told me. In exploring history's grand themes, he worked in the tradition of 19th century generalists, systematizers who straddled disciplines. A set of ideas, he believed, had to be coherent. He was enormously erudite, recalled Hayes, and deployed that knowledge brilliantly, and with heart. Once Ramapo realized that it had hired somebody special, said Hayes, there was never any question that he'd get tenure. Robert Cassidy the cautious vice president who'd approved Buchin's hiring, actively invited him to apply to become an associate professor. That's very rare, Hayes told me. He was a superb teacher. In 1976 Bookchin was promoted to associate professor in the School of Environmental Studies. In Vermont, the winter of 1975-76 was severe, but the ISE staff diligently logged the temperatures inside the Kate farmhouse. The solar installations, they found, did indeed heat the inside air sufficiently, and the well-insulated structure retained the heat even at night. If solar energy was practicable in sun-deprived central Vermont, then it could work pretty much anywhere. The 1976 summer session attracted a whopping 180 students, eager to become ecological pioneers. While Bookchin lectured on the domination of nature and its relation to the domination of human by human, the biological agriculture class set up experimental garden plots to test how well compost functioned as fertilizer compared to chemicals. The soil in the composted plots, they found, had higher and steadier rates of nitrogen uptake, while the chemical plots were more vulnerable to cucumber beetle infestations. So they blended compost with soil and sand and used it to grow cucumbers, tomatoes and bell peppers in the sunhouse, where the aquaculture tanks, meanwhile, yielded approximately 70 pounds of fish twice a year. Other students constructed several dozen 6 by 12 foot French intensive beds in the open fields. They dug soil two feet deep and mixed humus into it, then added layers of compost and topsoil, to form a low mound. These raised beds, which yielded the most produce in the least area, turned out to be eminently suitable for urban gardening, say on the Lower East Side or in Adams Morgan. It was about food for the poor and communities, aquaculturist Barry Costa Pierce told me. A lot of people call it integrated aquaculture, integrated with communities and with agriculture. Combining aquaculture and solar and wind power, it was now clear, could allow low-income urban neighborhoods to achieve self-reliance. 
Dan Chodorkov envisioned the ISE as, in part, an alternative agricultural extension service, sharing practical knowledge with people in urban ghettos as well as rural poor and Native Americans. The ISE set up a training program for a union of small farms in Puerto Rico, and it developed a strong connection with the Aquasassini Mohawk Nation. In upstate New York, John Mohawk and Ron LaFrance came to the ISE to teach, while ISE students traveled to Aquasassini to join political protests. But the poster child for achieving self reliance through alternative technology was Charis, on the Lower East Side. In 1976, as a result of the city's deliberate neglect, trash was yet again building up in the neighborhood, especially in abandoned buildings and vacant lots. Charis's cadre of high school students were by now adept at spotting promising vacant spaces, and they found one on 9th Street, between Avenues B and C. They cleared away the rubble and weeds and rats and established La Plaza Cultural there, a cultural center, an oasis of color in an otherwise bleak cityscape. Poets, musicians, and dancers now had a place to perform, and visual artists a place to display their work. A few blocks away an abandoned five-story tenement at 519 East 11th Street, between Avenues A and B, had been gutted by fire, the city acquired it, barely more than a shell, and boarded it up. In 1976 a group of young architects decided to buy and renovate it. Charis helped them obtain financing on the basis of their own labor, sweat equity loans, they were coming to be called, then helped them clear the building of garbage and rubble. On the roof, they installed a bank of flat plate solar collectors, the first rooftop solar panels in Manhattan. They found an old farm turbine, and about 40 people from Charis carried it up to the roof and set it up as a windmill, the first roof-mounted urban windmill in the United States. By 1977 the solar collectors and windmill were providing more than enough power to heat and illuminate 519 East 11th, the excess energy was going into the city's power grid. The residents demanded that Con Ed reimburse them, but it refused and took them to court. The 519 Group won, for the first time, a small-scale power generator received credit from a power company. Inspired by 519's success, Urban homesteaders took over 40 more neglected buildings in the neighborhood and renovated them, creating cooperatives, in what was called the 11th Street Movement. Charis helped many of them create rooftop gardens, hand fashion solar panels and windmills from scrap, and install them. One co-op set up a 300-gallon fish farm in the basement, plywood tanks stocked with trout, carp, catfish, tilapia, and crayfish. Charis cleared a vacant lot on the south side of East 12th Street, between A and B, where Linda Cohen, an ISE alumna, used growing and composting techniques she'd learned in Vermont to found El Sol Brillante, the first organic community garden on the Lower East Side. Wastewater from the neighborhood's fish tanks fertilized the garden, while vegetable wastes and worms from the garden nourished the fish. Through the use of such eco-techniques, Book Chin observed, Charis and its fellow Lois Aida residents gained control over the material conditions of their lives and thereby acquired a sense of neighborhood solidarity self-empowerment, and proficiency. In April 1976 the Neighborhood Power Movement coalesced into the Alliance for Neighborhood Government and the National Association of Neighborhoods. Meeting in Philadelphia, the two groups adopted a Bill of Rights for Neighborhoods that declared that people in neighborhoods can and should govern themselves democratically and justly. They should be able to determine their own goals, consistent with the broad civic ideas of justice and human equality, and to decisively influence all actions of government and private institutions affecting the neighborhood. During this bicentennial year of the American Revolution, Book Chin took a close look at American history and realized that that revolution's institutional engine had been, in fact, a kind of neighborhood government, the New England Town Meeting. The town meeting had originated in the 17th century when English Puritans established small villages in order to be able to practice their religion based on scripture alone. Religious autonomy became political autonomy, as these congregations doubled as citizens' assemblies, vested with authority to handle civil affairs. 
Over the course of a century New England townspeople gained the heady experience of face-to-face -face democratic self-governance. By 1776 the town meeting, along with the plethora of committees that sprang into existence throughout the colonies, had become a form of freedom comparable to the revolutionary sectional assemblies of 1793 Paris. After the revolution, the new, independent nations elites turned against what they considered tumultuous civic overparticipation and instituted a centralized government. Still, during the 200 years since then, town meeting self-government had persisted in northern New England, especially in Vermont. In the bicentennial year, Bookchin sought out Frank Bryan, an expert on the town meeting who taught at the University of Vermont. Sitting in his Burlington office one day, Brian heard this clumping from the two staircases, clomp clomp, and in walks this guy. He had on a black leather jacket. It was apparent from the minute he walked in the door that he was not, and I don't say this disparagingly, an academic. Although Bookchin was then an associate professor, he wasn't one of that crowd. Verily. Brian was impressed by Bookchin's interest in the town meeting, not only did he take it seriously, he had a paradigm for it. Brian and other Vermont libertarians at the time were concerned that the state government was eroding the powers of the town meeting. Coming from both the political left and right, they shared a belief that centralized power is the enemy of individual liberty, self-reliance, and voluntary cooperation. In March 1977 they joined forces to form the Decentralist League, to protect and if possible strengthen the town's powers. The right fears big government, and the left fears big business, Brian told me, but they both understood that it's really scale that matters. Bookchin joined the group, comfortable associating with right-wing libertarians, believing that they shared common ground, after all, his friendship and collaboration with Carl Hess, the one-time Goldwater speechwriter, remained close. And starting in the mid-1970s another one-time Goldwater supporter, John Clark, entered Buchan's orbit and quickly became his protege, soaking up all Murray had to teach about social ecology anarchism, and left social theory generally. Once Bookchin was awakened to the crucial role of the town meeting in the American Revolution, he came to realize that all the great Western revolutions had been based in cities, in places where ordinary people were concentrated, where they could share experiences, learn from one another, hear speeches, read local newspapers, discuss issues in clubs and cafes, organize political action, and become empowered. From Boston to Paris, St. Petersburg, and Barcelona, the great revolutionary movements had been urban in nature. Marx had been blind to this fact, preferring the factory as the revolutionary arena, and under his influence generations of leftists afterward had been similarly unseeing. But cities could recapture that role by recreating town meeting assemblies in their neighborhoods. In Montreal, the MCM, with its decentralist program, was committed to such a devolution of power. But Dmitri Rousseau-Polos was worried. The new party had so far failed to clarify how the neighborhood democracies were to be created and structured. It had not even instituted structures of democratic accountability between the movement and the 18 MCM city councillors. The pragmatists in the party were preparing a rebellion, insisting on transforming the MCM into a conventional parliamentary party. The next battle would be fought, both sides knew, at the following party congress, to be held in December 1976. The R Generation editorial board mobilized itself as a kind of think tank for the MCM's radical socialist left wing, and Rousseau Polas's living room became its hub. The phone lines between Ramapo and Montreal buzzed, and Bookchin came up from New Jersey often. In November 1976 he told a McGill audience that the citizen must replace the worker as the elusive historical agent that will effect revolutionary social change. While Bookchin was the charismatic and inspiring speaker, Rousseau Polas was the experienced organizer. Between the two of them, they developed and tested the program for creating neighborhood democracy. Montreal was their laboratory. The left wing, inspired by Bookchin, drafted a radical program to submit to the coming Congress. 
it committed the MCM to organizing committees on a street-by-street -street or block level. Each street or block committee would send delegates to the neighborhood council. The councils would become the organizational instruments through which the citizens could create a truly democratic power. Once the councils gained power, they must become, not part of the state apparatus, but an alternative power to the present state at all its levels. Murray praised this document as the most radical program of all. Once the Congress convened, the pragmatists tried to wrest control of the party executive, but the left fought back and stayed at the helm. In the end, the Congress adopted Rousseau Polas's radical socialist program. In the next two years, neighborhood organizing in Montreal's 19 districts would reach a crescendo.